Good morning. This morning, I am going to share a testimony, a deliverance for myself from uh, October 2019 when I was delivered of a spirit of pedophilia, as bad as that sounds. I was anointed and the fire of Holy Spirit came upon me and burned out this spirit. And that day I was healed of asthma, Hashimoto's, and a gluten intolerance. And I've had asthma since my late teens, which was actually a strange diagnosis. The doctor said normally... You don't get asthma in your late um, late teens, early 20s, but I did, and, so, and I'm 44 now. And so I was delivered of that two years ago. I have no medication. I don't carry anything around with me, and I have no gluten intolerance. I eat gluten, and I have no more Hashimoto's. And so I want to share how, how those things go together, but how we might not actually think that they go together because I didn't think so. So on my way to work um, two years ago, uh, 2019, on my way to work, Holy Spirit said, you're not free. And I thought, what do you mean I'm not free? I see Jesus. Like, I see angels. Like, you talk to me. I, I, how am I not free? I believe in Jesus. I, I'm a believer. I'm born again. I'm a new creation. So I start kind of arguing that point because that's a really harsh statement to say you're not free when Jesus paid for our freedom. And I, and I, and I know Jesus. I mean, I'm getting to know him better, but, but I know Jesus. And so I thought, well, maybe it's an enemy camp. Like, maybe a spirit's just, you know torment, trying to torment me. And it was a couple days before I went to Albuquerque on a mission trip. And so I thought maybe, you know, maybe there's something with that. So I go to work and I, I speak that out in, um, in prayer group. And so one of the prayer partners said, I'm going to anoint you with oil. And then, uh, when you're anointed with oil, you know, we're going to pray. And he just, you know, just explained anointing. Cause I don't think that I had ever been anointed. And if I had, I don't ever recall being anointed, you know, prior, prior to 2019. And so, um, so we prayed and when we started to pray, I saw myself in the spirit and how I can describe it. And especially two years ago, this is a brand new experience. I've not experienced this again. I've not experienced fire of Holy Spirit again. And, um, I, I'm just now getting to really, you know, seeing some things in the spirit. So this was, was very unusual for me. And so I spoke it out so I could see um, down so I could see myself, but it wasn't me in the physical. It was like me in like a dreamlike, like state. I could best describe it. And I see this fire coming out, and it's a beautiful fire though. It's like glowing and it's soft and it's beautiful. It's not like a raging wildfire, you know, that we see when we have all our forest fires. It's not that destructive, you know, raging fire. This was was beautiful, but I could also feel it. I could feel this sensation in my body that I have never felt before. Now I've since seen other and heard other people's testimonies about fire of Holy Spirit and how much it hurt and, you know, burning and whatever. But this was just, I mean, it was beautiful, but it was the most strange, bizarre sensation because like I could feel on the inside what I was seeing radiating out. And I was just so blessed that Holy Spirit opened my eyes to that and that I actually got to see what was happening to me in the spirit because then it leads to this testimony. He says, he tells me that this channel is for me to proclaim and to testify the things that, that he's done because if he's done it for me, he's going to do it for you and he'll do it for your loved ones and other people that you know. And so I'm learning that when you get to see things in the spirit, or hear things, it's it's always to glorify Jesus. It's always to set you free. It's it's not for self glorification or, or anything like that. And we and and for those that need a scripture reference, John chapter three, uh, verse three says that you must be born again to see into the kingdom of God. And then John chapter three verse five says uh, you must be born again, you know, to enter in. So see and enter are two different things. So we can see and enter into the kingdom because we are spirit beings. And Jesus said that in the book of John, he said that the Father is looking for those to worship him in spirit and in truth. You're a spirit being that was put in into a body. Jeremiah 1.5 says, um, Jeremiah 1.5 says, I knew you before I knit you together in your mother's womb. I knew you. That means you were something. You and I were something before we were physically put into our mother's womb, made, you know, that way physically and into a physical body. So we are we are spiritual creatures in these physical bodies. And so we can see and enter into the kingdom. So he allowed me to see myself on fire. Well, I heard spirit of pedophilia, which I thought I'm not saying that out loud. Like that sounds absolutely horrible. Like on, I'll be honest. I thought if I say that out loud, these people are going to think I'm a pervert. Like they're going to think that I'm a pedophile. And that's, that's really what I thought. But I know that that's just the enemy playing with my mind because if I didn't speak it out, I didn't get delivered from it. And if I'm not honest, then, then nothing happens. And Holy Spirit 
always speaks the truth. How do we know that? And so it says, and I'm going to give you another scripture reference, in John chapter 16, verse 13. However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own authority. Whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father have are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. So he is the spirit of truth. So when we accept Jesus and we believe that Jesus is the son of God and he died on our sins and he was um, buried and resurrected three days later and ascended to the Father, he said he would send us the Holy Spirit, our counselor, and he would speak whatever he sees. And so Holy Spirit spoke out spirit of pedophilia, but I was just traumatized by that. And I thought, I don't want to, I don't want to speak that out. So I didn't. So we finished praying and I could still feel this like burning sensation, but I'd spoke out, you know, the fire. And I was told that Holy Spirit was just burning out something that didn't, that didn't belong, that, that, and I always thought fire was a bad thing. I, I knew a little bit about, about fire, but I always thought that fire would just be destruction. Well, yeah, fire is destruction for the enemy. Fire is not destruction for you and I. And I want to give you an example of that. So if we go to 1 Thessalonians, I've got some marked here. In 1 Thessalonians 9, uh, 5, 19, it says, Do not quench the Holy Spirit. Do not despise prophecies, test all things, hold to what is good. So do not quench the Holy Spirit. Well, it's with the word quench, and quench in, in the concordance means to extinguish. Well, you can only extinguish fire. I mean, you can't extinguish water. And so do not extinguish the Spirit. So the Spirit is fire. And so um, so Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit is fire. And then another story I want to share about that is in the book of Daniel. So we all know the story in Daniel with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And something that we need to learn as believers about the Old Testament that Holy Spirit has been showing me over the last two years is the Old Testament is full of the spiritual realm. So we see Jesus showing, so the physical realm and the spiritual realm are directly connected, directly connected to the two. And so, or together, I should say to the two, they're connected together. And so um, when we read the test, the stories in the Old Testament, we can see what we can see in the spiritual realm. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel chapter 4, verse 20. And he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and their garments and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent, the furnace exceedingly hot the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they actually should have been burnt up before they were even put in there. And then the three men took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then the king Neb Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast these three men bound into the midst of the fire? So there are four times we see the word bound or bind. And then in the book of Job, remember, um, Father asked Job, um, Can you bind or loose, you know, Orion, Orion, Pilates, and, and somebody else, those stars, those constellations, those angels? And then in Matthew 16 and Matthew 18, 18, 18, and 1618, I might get the scripture references wrong, but then Jesus said, and you will buy what you bind on earth, you bind in heaven, what you loose on earth, you loose in heaven. So Jesus, we went from seeing bind here and loose here. And then in the book of Job, before Jesus was um, on the cross and died for our sins, we see that nobody could bind and loose anything. And then Jesus is speaking in Matthew, you will. When will you do that? When he has died on the cross, paid for the sins, uh, is resurrected three days later and then gives us the gift of Holy Spirit. We get Holy Spirit when we accept Jesus because he comes to abide in us. But then we also get the, the gift of the Holy Spirit upon us and the fire of Holy Spirit when we're baptized with Holy Spirit. It's two different things. Just like Jesus had Holy Spirit, obviously he had Holy Spirit because he was Jesus and he knew it was Jesus who was saved, like how we get saved. But when Jesus, when Jesus got baptized, he got baptized. And remember the dove came upon him and the father said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. That's when he started his ministry. That's when Jesus was empowered by Holy Spirit, like you and I can be empowered by Holy Spirit. So we see the binding here in Daniel, and we see the fire here in Daniel. So then it goes, he says, look, he answered, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. So there we see the binding and loosing. And so then we go down to verse 27, and it says, And the satraps, administrators, governors, and the king's counselors gathered together, and they saw these men 
on whose bodies the fire had no power. The hair on their head was not singed, nor their garments affected, and the smell of fire was not on them. And so then Nebuchadnezzar praises the, the only one true God, our Father, um, Jesus and Holy Spirit. And so we learn here what got burnt off, a spirit of bondage. What was the only thing that touched them was the ropes. The ropes were binding them in the physical and binding them in the, in the spirit, and Holy Spirit burnt that off. It never hurt them, never touched them. And so there's an example of burning, you know, in the physical. So we see that burning there. And then we have um, Jesus' examples of, you know, binding and loosing. And then we're not to quench, you know, the fire of Holy Spirit. And so Holy Spirit is fire. And so he was burning out something in me that didn't belong. But I just, I just didn't know that. And it was two days before I went on a mission trip, which I'm learning. He really refines me and we go through things before I go on a mission trip to make sure that there's, you know, nothing in, nothing in the way there. So I go and make coffee and, and I hear spirit of pedophilia over and over again. So I thought, I'm not going to say that. Like, this sounds horrible. But the more I heard it, the more I know that when I hear those things repeated like that, that's Holy Spirit speaking it. And when he repeats itself, it means I need to listen. I, I need to do it. it. It means it's pressing. It's important. And I'm so grateful that he's so patient um, for us and our shortcomings. So I go back and, and I speak that out. I say, hey, I need to speak this out. You know, I, I need to, to share this um, because I'm hearing it. And so um, I spoke out, you know, the spirit of pedophilia that I was molested. I was raped at a young age. And, um, and so we prayed it out. Like we just, and it was super easy. I mean, Jesus doesn't make things difficult. You don't have to do a ritual. You don't have to do all these weird things. We just prayed and we cast it out because he says, what you bind, what you loose. And Jesus gave us the authority to cast out spirits and demons. And so that's what we did. And because I'm a believer doesn't mean that I am immune to that. It wasn't in me. It wasn't possessing me. But it definitely was oppressing me. It definitely had entered into my life. And even though I was saved, was still there. And I know as believers, unbelievers don't typically have a problem with, with spiritual stuff like, like this, like demon, demonic, you know, and ghosts and like that kind of stuff. But believers, we tend to have a problem with understanding that we are attacked by spirits, that we are attacked by witchcraft, that we are attacked by this. Otherwise, we wouldn't need Ephesians. We wouldn't need Thessalonians. We wouldn't need all of these other books. We Look at the book of Acts. Like, look at all the things that happened to them. It, it, definitely spiritual things, warfare, as some people want to call it, definitely spiritual going on, and they were walking super close to Jesus. You know, Paul saw Jesus, and look at look at the afflictions and torments that he had because of the enemy. The enemy gets in however way the enemy can get in. So um, we spoke it out, and this is what was, was cool and then kind of crazy, is literally, so when we prayed, I felt like, and I never, I didn't feel it before, but literally when we prayed, I felt like somebody's hands were like this on me. And then I felt that, like I literally felt this weight come off of me. I literally felt this, this, this come off of me. And I can't tell you when, when I knew that I was healed um, from asthma and Hashimoto's and my gluten intolerance. I, I'm not quite sure when that happened. I mean, it happened that day, but I'm not sure when I was aware of it. I know that some people will say um, that they, that they, like feel something or, or whatever. I just, it was like, I just knew, you know, if I had back pain or if my ears got opened or something that that's an immediate thing. I, I just knew that, 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 that had happened. And so, um, it took, it's, it's two years now and I'm not had, I don't, I don't have asthma. I don't have Hashimoto's and I don't have gluten and, and all of that gluten intolerance and all of that is documented in my medical file that I have all those things and I don't have them anymore. And so in the beginning, and this will just be a little, little plug for medicine. I'll be doing some more videos and stuff on that. But um, a little plug for the medicine was I still carried my inhaler around for a little while because I carried that thing since I was 19. I'm 44 years old. I didn't realize that I was a slave to it. I didn't realize what a, what a crutch that was for me. And the Holy Spirit spoke that one day. He said, you're a slave to that. Because whatever, and it was because, you know, I believe what the doctor said. They proclaimed death over me. If you don't have this and you have an asthma attack, you're going to die. I mean, I was hospitalized in my 20s with pneumonia. I was told by my doctor I was going to die if I didn't, you know, listen to the things that he was going to say. I mean, they spoke death over me and, and I took it. I received it. And so I didn't go anywhere. And if I didn't have this inhaler, I would freak out and I would start to have an asthma attack. It's like, I don't have my inhaler. What if I need my inhaler? And so I didn't realize that I was a slave to that. And Jesus... Jesus' blood paid for me not to be a slave to anything. Medicine can't heal you. Medicine can't cure anything because if it did, if it could, wouldn't I have been cured from asthma? You know, I wouldn't have it for over 20 years. I wouldn't be tied to this medicine. I wouldn't be carrying it around, all the money. I mean, it's a total slave system because it costs a lot of money. A lot of people can't afford the medication. You know, all those things. So then I stopped carrying it. So it's like I, had, I went through this, 
stayed with it. So I stopped carrying it and I just left it at home. I didn't, and, and it was weird. It was so weird for me not to have it. I felt like something was missing from me because I always had to have it, whether it was in my pocket, if I didn't have my purse, if I was hiking, you know, if I was snowboarding, if we were on the beach, wherever, wherever I was, I had to have that stupid thing on me. So it was weird. It took a little bit. And then last year sometime, um, I threw it away. I finally was like, I'm throwing away all my medication. And that was when I really, because you've got to receive. I mean, Jesus will do these things for you, but you have to receive it. And I had to be willing to receive, you know, that healing and trust him because I was so brainwashed to to just all of this. And I'm sure I'm going to get backlash for those comments, but but this is my testimony. This is the truth. I do not carry any of these things. I am not sick anymore. And in fact, when I went to the hospital, not this November, but last November, I got this really weird attack and it took me out for a couple of days and I couldn't breathe. But when I went to the hospital, they, um, they did my pulse ox, it was 99 and they did my lungs. They did everything. And they said, there's nothing wrong with you, but it felt, it felt like asthma, but I knew it wasn't asthma, but they couldn't find anything wrong. But the, the point of that story is to share that they said my lungs were so healthy and that, and they hadn't said that to me, you know, in years, my lungs were healthy and my pulse ox, I don't even know my pulse ox was ever 99. And so that to say, you know, that I'm told that I'm totally healed, but I had this, I, I was a slave to the, to the system. Gluten, I ate gluten all the time. Hashimoto's, my doctor told me that I couldn't beat that naturally. Uh, and and for a while before you know I was healed, I didn't eat gluten and um, I did some other things. I took some natural D, you know, I took some natural vitamins. I don't take pharmaceutical stuff, but I took some natural vitamins and just kind of watched my diet or whatever. And I could watch my blood work change, you know, with my Hashimoto's based on just the things that, that I put in my body. And so now I'm completely delivered, you know, and healed from that. And so just an amazing testimony you know, of Jesus, but like I said, I didn't know right away, but I knew it is a very strange thing, but two years. So almost two, oh, almost two years. No. Yeah. Almost two years, like a year and a half, like a year and a half, um, for that. So let me share with you guys, uh, for a few minutes, just how that spirit entered into my life. So I came to Jesus at a very young age. I was tormented and, and traumatized, um, as a young child. And I'll do another video on that. And at the age of 11 and fifth grade, I was molested by my, um, my friend's older brother. Uh, it only happened once and I didn't tell anybody. And I just, maybe I didn't really know that it was a big deal. I mean, I knew it was wrong and I knew he shouldn't be doing it, but I didn't, you know, and I got away as fast as I could, but it's just one of those things like we don't teach, we don't teach our kids a lot of times these things. Like I'm, I've made sure that I've shared a lot of things with my children so they understand right and wrong and what should be done to them and shouldn't be done. And so, but you know, the Holy Spirit just, just tells you, just have that feeling. And then at the age of 13, I had a 15 year old friend who had a 19 year old boyfriend and a friend and we went out and I was in eighth grade and I didn't have boyfriends. I mean, you know, you had like, like the little boyfriends, you know, like, Oh, he's my boyfriend or whatever, but never, you know, didn't do anything. Didn't, didn't kiss boys, you know, didn't go places, you know, didn't do any of those things. And it was the first time I ever drank, drank Jim Beam straight out of the bottle and drank half a fifth. I probably should have gone to the emergency room for alcohol poisoning. So um, long story short, um, I was raped by this 19 year old boy. I didn't instigate it. I didn't, I didn't kiss him. I didn't, I didn't do anything. There was a lot that I didn't remember. There was a lot that, that I blocked out and I didn't tell anybody. Didn't tell my parents because my mom was her own mess, not with Jesus and a drug addict and all kind of demonic problems. It was super abusive to me growing up. So I wasn't going to tell her because she would just call me a whore and say that that's, you know, I got what I deserved. So I didn't tell anybody. And I thought, if you don't tell anybody, nothing's going to happen. You know, if nobody ever knows, like I only know and he only knows. So if nobody knows, then, then it didn't happen. So I lived that way. I lived that way until I was 35. I didn't share that with anybody until I had a breakdown at 35. And that's when father spoke to me. And there's only been a couple times in my life that I, I know distinctly that it was father. Like I can tell and hear the difference between father, Jesus, and Holy Spirit. But sometimes I know, I can't tell, but I know that this was father speaking to me. And he said, I know it happened to you, but we're going to have to talk about it. And that was what I didn't want to do. I didn't want to talk to anybody, much less talk, talk to, to father about that, you know, because I knew I shouldn't have been there. Not, I'm not excusing what he did because what he did was wrong and it was rape, period. But I knew had I been at home, had I not been drinking, you know, that wouldn't have happened to me. And so we went through the details. We went through the details of me not fighting back when, because uh, I was in and out of consciousness because I, I drank so much and so much I don't, I just don't remember. But there were details. And so I guilted myself 
and I'm professing this for the first time, I guilted myself for not fighting back. Like, not that I even could have fought him off of me, but I, I, I carried the shame of that, you know, and the guilt of that. And now I know that that was all the enemy. You know, you get in these situations and then the enemy just beats you up over every decision that you make and it just puts you in bondage. And so I had that happen at 13. I did start drinking and doing drugs at 13. And that's a whole other testimony. And, um, and then um, in high school, my mom got arrested for pharmaceuticals, writing her, I'm sorry, writing her own prescriptions. And we didn't know she got arrested, she went to jail, like all this kind of stuff. My mom was, was super crafty at, at what she did. And she stole a lot, she stole a lot from me, stole a lot from my, my dad. And um, she had probation. She actually used me to do um, police officers day in Shreveport. Like I was on the news, like all this stuff. And it was actually for her own, her own community service for her pro probation. Well, then she got t connected to this high profile attorney who did her case for a pro bono. And he is now deceased. He was in his 80s. He died a couple years ago. And in his 80s, he was finally convicted of lewd acts with minors. So in his 80s, he was convicted. So my mom... Um, told me that I was going to get this modeling contract because this was a high profile turn entry board, very high profile. And, and as a high schooler, like I was 14, 15, 16 when this went on, and it's because I started high school early. And so I never knew, um, I never understood the things that I understand now, like why he would, why he would do that. Well, now I know because he was a pedophile, he was a pervert. That's why he was a predator. And so my mom would buy these lingerie things for me to wear, to take pictures, and they were always with Polaroids. And back then, you know, Polaroids were kind of popular. And then one day we had a, a, um, photo shoot at his house. And I remember going into his dark room, like he had his own dark room, which now I know, like there's no tell on how many more victims there were of this man. But I remember going into that dark room and thinking it was creepy. And that kind of reminded me of that movie, um, Nine Millimeter, which I can't believe I watched that movie with Nicolas Cage, where there's that, that scene. And that scene was like, used to be a trigger for me because I knew in that dark room, like it was, it was weird that he had, that he had this dark room and he developed his own pictures, you know, and did all that stuff. And so, uh, so I went there for a photo shoot and he would say inappropriate, you know, gross stuff. And my mom would just say, oh, he's, he's like a grandpa, you know, just treat him like a grandpa. Well, I never had a grandpa because my grandpa was deceased, but I'm pretty sure my grandpa wouldn't say stuff like that to me. But she just discounted it like, oh, he just talks like that and it's like not a big deal. Well, it wasn't until, and so that stopped. So he would take me to all these, you know, luncheons and take me to these very expensive places. And I never realized that I was being groomed. You know, people talk about being groomed. I never realized that I was being groomed to be molested and to be raped by this man. And only by Jesus was, was I not. And so um, when I was maybe 19, so it stopped. And I don't even know when it stopped, when I stopped having to go to lunches and all that. Maybe it was when he figured nothing was going to happen. I don't know. But it stopped. And then when I was maybe 18, 19, when I was in college, and my mom tried to kill herself for like the umpteenth time, and um, I went into her room. Holy Spirit led me to this, this, this chest. Well, in this chest, she had all these, like, that's how we found out how many times she was arrested, you know, and all this stuff. Well, in there were these cards and pictures of myself. These cards were written to this man, to this attorney, and they were written from me, signed by me with pictures of me in there. And they said the most lewd, pornographic, you know, things that I wouldn't even say now. Like, I'm a married woman. I could say whatever I want to to my husband. And I'm definitely not saying the stuff that's, that's in these cards. I mean, it, it was, it was written pornography is what it was. And so that's how I knew my mom definitely knew what was going on. And she was actually setting me up to be molested by this man was because she was sending him these cards for his birthday and on different occasions with pictures of me. So it made it look like I was soliciting sex, you know, to, to this man. And so there again, the spirit of pedophilia, you know, I'm, I'm under age, um, you know, very, very inappropriate. And then in college, I was raped at a college party. And that, I believe, I actually believe I was drugged um, during that time. Uh, that was when Rohypanols were super big. You would go to Mexico and, and buy, you know, a whole bunch of them. Uh, I know because I, I did that as one of the things that I did uh, when I just spiraled out of control. And so I went to this party. Same thing. I remember being on the floor, you know, with a whole bunch of people because it was back when you had those big apartment um, parties, you know, in college and you have like 20 people in an apartment, everybody's just crashing someplace. And we were going to the Nacogdoches or Nacogdoches. I can't remember which, which, which word it is, uh, Christmas lights, the Christmas festival lights that are, that are always in movies and stuff. And, um, and I remember him carrying me to the bedroom and then, uh, and then I just remember bits and pieces of that because, because of the alcohol there again, probably should have gone to the hospital. So after that, I spiraled out of control for a number of years. Um, and just, just didn't share things with people. I did share that one with someone 
and my best friend, and she didn't believe me. And then as it turns out, that same guy, uh, who's very prominent and actually is a very prominent person now in the Louisiana area, he um, raped four other girls. Because rape is not about who you can get and how much money you have and all of that. It's, it's about power and control. It's about, it's, yeah, it's just about so many other things. And so I carried all of those things. Well, I, at 35, I'd received healing for, um, for some of that, especially the one at 13. But what I didn't realize was that that spirit was still around and that spirit was causing me, causing me issues, causing me, you know, sicknesses. And so that, that's my testimony of um, the fire of Holy Spirit. And so fire of Holy Spirit is a real thing. Like he is real and he is beautiful. And the anointing, I want to share um, another scripture just about anointing. This one is in Mark 6.13. So Mark 6.13. And they cast, oh, it says, and, and they went out and preached that many people should repent. And they cast out many de demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. And so, so there again, so when I was making my first video like this, Holy Spirit spoke to me and I wrote my little note here. He says that oil, anointing oil is not magical oil. I mean, but we see people were anointed. And um, here's another one that he gave me, First Samuel. So let me go to First Samuel and read that one to you. So First Samuel 16, 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and ran to, went to Ramah. And so we see that Holy Spirit oil, or when you get anointed with oil, it's a physical thing that ties us to the spiritual realm. It's not magical. And then we pray. So when I anoint people, I always pray for Holy Spirit to set it on fire. Why do I pray for him to set it on fire? Because he set me on fire. And I actually saw that in the spiritual realm. So I have my belief and my faith in that, that when people let me anoint them and I pray over them, I know that he's touching them. It may not be a spirit of pedophilia. It's going to be something else. But it doesn't matter. The testimony and the testifying is that I was anointed with oil and the Holy Spirit spoke out. He, he burned it literally out of my life and out of the spirit, out of me. And then as a result, I was healed from physical manifestations. I was healed from illnesses that that particular spirit was causing. And to this day, like I, I always, I thank Jesus like off and on for my healing because I was a slave. I was a slave to the inhaler. I was a slave to death. I was a slave to believing that I needed that, but who would have thought? A spirit of pedophilia, something that came in, a sexual trauma, was actually causing something that you wouldn't even think would be related to it. And so um, so I hope that you're blessed and encouraged by this message today that Jesus is just beautiful and he constantly, he wants to heal us, he wants to restore us. And then when you're healed, when you're healed from something, it doesn't come back. So that spirit will not come back. The sicknesses will not come back because when Jesus heals, it is permanent. When, when science or man or whatever, they, nobody could heal me of Hashimoto's. They wanted to shut my, my thyroid down. They wanted me to take a pill that would shut my own thyroid down and I would have to take this pill for the rest of my life. That is not freedom. That is a slave system. The asthma, expensive, um, preventative medic medication, always having to have that albuterol with me. And then the gluten intolerance, like, do you know how not freeing it is to have a food allergy? Because then you're constantly watching everything. And so it's just making a heyday in the spirit and I'm not free. And now I can proclaim that I have total freedom over that in through and in the blood of Jesus and through his Holy Spirit. So be blessed today, be encouraged. And if any of you want me to pray for you, you can always um, message me. I'll put my email address, my ministry email address in the in the description. And so, cause I've never had a couple people ask for prayer. I would be more than happy to pray with you or talk to you. And because Jesus wants to heal you, he wants to deliver you and he wants to free you. That is what his blood paid for on the cross. That is what he preached. He said he went around healing all, not some. He went around healing all and he left us with the great commission. And he left us with with that command to go out and to preach the word, to baptize, to cast out demons, to heal the sick and raise the dead. He has left us with that. And so be blessed, be encouraged today, and you guys have an amazing day in Jesus' name.